Welcome to the National Women's Fitness Academy podcast. We're here to talk about women's health, female hormones, body image, and all things health and fitness. Hello, girls, and welcome back to another episode of the Women's Fitness Academy's podcast. I'm your host, C, one of the WFA's educators and a women's body image and mindset coach. Today, I'm chatting with the lovely Tara Thorne, who is a functional nutritionist and a woman, a women's health expert. Now, Tara has gone through her fair share of adrenal fatigue and struggles with anxiety and is going to share with us all um, and also sharing her wisdom with you today on how you can reclaim your health like she did and the way that she's educating more women around the world to do the same. So Tara, thank you so much for joining me. And I would love to open the conversation with asking you, what was that pivotal point in your suffering to make a better change? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here and to to share with the the ladies in your community. So I think there are actually two pivotal points. Um, the first one happened when I moved from Australia to Canada. So I lived in Canada, I was sharing with you before. I lived in Canada for 12 years. And when I, I first moved to Canada with my now husband, I had severe anxiety. It just came on. And I re remember it was a about four weeks or so I lived in this state of incredible turmoil. Like perhaps they were panic attacks, I guess. Anyway, this was a while back. This is 2007. And it was really horrific. I'd never experienced anything like that before. And anyway, I went off to the doctor. My husband's cousin actually came to get me one day because I, I couldn't be alone and my husband was working and she took me off to the doctor and the doctor gave me an anti-anxiety pill, which stopped the anxiety like that. And then also gave me antidepressants as the longer term solution. Now, listen, you know, I think I've always been, in been interested in health and wellness, but that got me thinking Surely what I'm going through is not a product of a anti-depressant de deficiency that, you know, like there's got to be a reason. And I think that's just the way my brain works is like, what's the reason for this? I don't want to just slap a Band-Aid on. And I wasn't, you know, I, I don't think that medic medications are wonderful and they absolutely helped me when I needed them. And I'm all for medication when it's required. Absolutely. But I thought if there's a way to do this that doesn't require medication, then I want to investigate that. So I guess that was kind of the first little hurdle that got me thinking more seriously about health and wellness. And then I went through, I had my first daughter and I got postpartum anxiety and postpartum thyroiditis that really um, expedited my growth, my learning in this area. And then I had my second daughter and I quite, hadn't quite learned my lessons and I was still burning the candle at both ends. And that's when I really got slapped with that sort of adrenal fatigue. Um, and, you know, it really was difficult after my second daughter. And I just kept learning and learning. So I think, yeah, there was probably two. It was the anxiety and then it was having the babies that really made me go, wow, this is not the way life is supposed to be. There's got to be something else I can do to support my body that doesn't include medication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. It's so interesting to hear your your story because it, what, it didn't ha only happen once, it happened twice, but you also went... Um, about your way to investigate a little bit more about why they're pushing on the medication onto you. And like you said, you had this urge in you that this shouldn't be a long-term solution. Mm -hmm, exactly, yeah. I mean, listen, I think that for me, my issues probably stemmed even back in my childhood. When I was growing up, I think there was a lot of, there was a lot of yelling and screaming and such. And I think that my adrenals took a hit when I, I was young and I didn't know because we're not taught this stuff, right? So I didn't know that my nervous system had been beaten and battered down so badly that I had to repair it. So I didn't repair it because I didn't know. And I lived, lived my 20s and I partied and I had fun. And that's why I think, 
you know, I reached that stage when we moved to Vancouver and I had the anxiety. I hadn't done any of that work on my nervous system. And then I had the babies. And again, I hadn't done that work on the nervous system. So it's kind of a shame. And that's why I do what I do today, because hopefully I can get in front of women who don't have to suffer like I did. They hear what I have to say before they hit their first or their second, you know, hurdle like I had. That's that's the hope anyway, because there are things we can do. We don't have to rely on the medication, but we're just not taught these things. We're not taught them in schools. Our governments don't have a clue. Our allopathic medical system, whilst it's brilliant and much needed, and I have a lot of gratitude for allopathic medicine, it doesn't understand nutrition, mm -hmm. nervous system you know, um, nutrient repletion, all these types of things that functional medicine understands. Mm, I, I truly um, agree with that, especially when it comes to um, our upbringing and our environments. Like you said, you know, it stemmed, some of it stemmed from your childhood. And I can so relate to that because I was used to being in a household of just shouting and yelling or stone calling completely. So my body or my nervous system just didn't know the difference between what's good and what's bad. It was just like a whole bunch of fucking chaos. So yeah, it makes, exactly. yeah, it makes so much sense why your anxiety stemmed back at your adulthood. Because again, like you said, you didn't know how to regulate your nervous system. Oh, yeah. And it's those constant onslaughts and never knowing when the other shoe is going to drop and the yelling and the screaming. I mean, what that does to your nervous system as a kid, it really can mess you up. And um, and so, yeah, what happened in our childhood can really impact us as we go through life. So, you know, if there is anyone listening who also had yelling and screaming in their childhood and you've not done that nervous system work to calm things down, that's going to be your best friend. And, you know, I work with women in my program and part of the program is to do nervous system work. I'm a big believer in meditation because we've got so much science around it. You know, so I'm a big believer in meditation. Anybody can do it. It's free. People say to me often, I, I can't, I, I can't do that because my mind goes. I was like, well, that's right. That's why they call it a practice, yeah. you know. That's, that's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? It, it? It's like saying, oh, well, I can't, you know, go for that 5K walk because I've never done it before. Well, not exactly. That's why you've got to do it, you know. But I'm a big believer in meditation, in deep breathing, because, again, completely free. We can all stop and do it in five minutes, you know. But it, there's so much resistance around that nervous system piece, mm. and I get it. So I was resistant to a type A and that's why I faltered again because I was running two businesses and I was studying and I had two babies and I wouldn't slow down. I didn't want to take five minutes to do nothing, you know, but it catches up to you. And whether or not you've had a childhood experience like ours or you haven't had that, but you're in that chronic go, 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 go state and you never slow down, it catches up to you. So mm. slowing down on the daily taking 10 minutes I mean 10 minutes is a much really I think you know it'd be good if we could take 10 minutes three times a day and just do nothing but close our eyes and meditate or breathe deeply or get out into nature go for a walk without being on your phone you know these mm -hmm. things are free and they go a long way for our mental health and our physical health as well Mm, isn't it interesting because there's so much resistance till today about just taking time out or just resting and I know it's also because of like the high functioning culture that we live in everyone's like go 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 success you have to work and grind and you know it's interesting because I still get that from my parents you know bless them love them to bits but they're they're very old school mentality where if you're not busy or you're not working hard on anything that you're doing, you're not successful, where it's just like, actually, it should be the other way around. Like there's always a season in, in your life where you need to, you know, hustle and grind and work, but it shouldn't be a 24 hour clock thing because otherwise you burn out and speaking of burnout it literally happened to me this month you know I was away for work I was out and about doing god knows so many things and like catching up with people and then taking business calls and then my body ended up just going shut down I got really sick I got burnt out 
And it's a sign telling you that you need to prioritize your rest because otherwise, like you said, it catches up to you. It catches up to you. Exactly. And this is what I try to tell my clients is that don't wait for it to catch up to you. Listen, easier said than done. I'm not perfect by any means, you know, but my kids know. (laughs) They'll say, mommy, should we relax? You know, because I'm always saying, I want to relax. I just want to relax. You know, I'm good at relaxing. I'm not that person who thinks I've got to go, 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 and I can't be idle. I'm, I'm not like that. And yeah, granted, um, I probably used to be like that when my kids were smaller, just because I was I was in a different season of life though, building a business. Now I can relax a bit more, but I'm all for the relaxing as much as possible. Um, but yeah, listen, we will go through those stages sometimes when I uh, listen, I was there about a week or so ago. Things were really busy, you know, and I, I don't want to be busy, but they just were for yeah. whatever reason. Yeah. And it's not the norm. I try not to pack my life like that. And I felt it as well. I really felt it. And so we actually took ourselves off last weekend. We went to a water park with the with the kids and we just sort of spur of the moment was like, let's just go away. I needed to be off my computer. I needed to be away from everything, have a bit of fun just to reset my nervous system because my nervous system is so sensitive that it doesn't take much for me to feel physically restrained if I'm feeling overwhelmed Mm. so yeah I want to dive yeah I want to dive into that because you know you said you're very big on regulating your nervous system but you've also realized that it doesn't take much for for you to feel that anxiety or you know that dysregulation so what you mentioned deep breathing and meditation is really you know good for you but what are some other practices that have helped you regulate your nervous system when you notice that big spark in you know the the anxious style honestly for me I guess it's multifaceted so um I I meditation deep breathing a hundred percent is what calms me being mindful coming back into the moment because if i I'm what happens when we're upregulated is we're often quite anxious or we're thinking about a million things. So bringing myself back into the moment and that's where the deep breathing and the meditation can really help, but literally just um, tuning in to thinking, am I thinking about all these things I've got to do or what's happening in the future and looking around the room and literally saying what I can see, saying what I can smell, you know, bringing myself back into the moment. That is huge. I also like to do, uh, I take baths all the time, with lots of salts and I'll put on some calming music and that's very soothing off my phone, doing my deep breathing. But then also, you know, I think personally, I have somebody who I speak to, I call him like a spiritual mentor, but, you know, I think it's important for people if they feel called to have some kind of therapist or somebody, there's so many different modalities. I'm not um, completely well-versed in all the different modalities, but like there's EDMR, I think it is, and somatic healing and all these different modalities that people can choose from EFT, the emotional freedom technique, tapping. There's a ton of things you can do. But for me personally, it comes back to the meditation, the the, ba- the baths, the deep breathing, being mindful. And then obviously you need to feel your body correctly. So mm. like a simple thing for an upregulated nervous system is blood sugar balance. Mm. So if your blood sugar is up and down and all around, you're going to be causing yourself so much more heartache because you're going to be more anxious. Maybe your sleep will suffer. Your moods are going to be erratic. Your PMS may be worse. So balancing your blood sugar and also repl- but replenishing nutrients, in particular minerals, which can be very soothing, calming. These things are very important. So you couple sort of the more spiritual nervous system work with the diet and with nutrient repletion. And I think when you marry those two things and really focus on those things, that's when you get that calm and you can really support your nervous system. Mm, I absolutely love that combination. It's more of a holistic way of not just the spiritual side of thing, but it's also, you know, the mindfulness and also the physical, because again, like, as you mentioned, you can do all the woo stuff as possible, but if you're not managing your nutrition, your training, your other types of, you know, aspects of your health, of course, you're going to find that imbalance. And I love that you opened the conversation around um, imbalanced sugar levels, because it's very common um, with us women, especially those who are type A's, who are always on the go, 
we tend to be stuck on our computers doing all the work and then eventually it like hits 2 p.m. and you're like, oh, I've only drank a coffee today. I'm exhausted. That's right. Exactly. So getting enough protein is huge, especially for women who are in their 40s or coming into the perimenopausal years. As we age, protein becomes becomes more and more important due to something called anabolic resistance. So but that protein is that macro, that master macro that stabilizes our blood sugar. Minerals help to stabilize blood sugar. So you've got to, in my opinion, it's very important to test those minerals and to replete them. Um, but yeah, protein, some healthy fat and fiber, eating three meals a day, eating enough protein. Uh, these types of things are really going to help with that blood sugar. And, you know, sometimes with women, they just work on supporting blood sugar and lots of symptoms completely disappear. And, mm -hmm. and it's usually the anxiety, the PMS and the sleep type issues and fatigue as well. Um, so, yeah, blood sugar is one part of the puzzle, but is a foundational part of the puzzle. Mm. Speaking of perimenopause, uh, but also the women who are entering into their 40s, what are some mistakes that you've seen or even that you've experienced around, you know, protein intake or nutrition in general? Yeah. So common mistakes would be um, definitely not eating enough protein, yeah. definitely not eating enough protein, thinking they are you know, thinking just because they include animal foods in their diet, they must have enough protein. So that's a huge one. Um, women definitely eating too many grains. So as you know, I'm not like anti-grain, I'm not anti-anything. And I don't, I'm not going to live my life never having another grain. Again, I'm not a perfectionist. But grains, especially as we get into these perimenopausal years, they can cause a lot of inflammation in the body and they can imbalance blood sugar. So maybe consuming too many grains, not enough protein, definitely mistakes would be um, over-exercising or yeah. under-exercising. It's usually one or the other. So they're oftentimes, you know, in our 40s, we start to see some weight creeping on, you know, and that's a big focus for a lot of women is their weight. And it's a real shame because I think we have to be realistic at this time. There are things that are going to change and there is a little bit of weight that's probably going to come on. It doesn't have to be a lot. And I do believe that we need to change the way that we eat so, to support our metabolic health. So I'm all about health first and then the weight loss should flow if you need weight loss. Mm. But in order to metabolic health it's reduce or eliminate depending your grain consumption focus on protein and produce that's my little dietary mantra for everybody if you eat animal protein and produce mainly vegetables with fruit too you can't go wrong you know and then you know obviously as perimenopausal women we want to train correctly so not too much and not too little so weight bearing exercise and just walking is is fantastic you know so it's definitely a common mistake women putting on weight and thinking i need to do more exercise i need to do more hardcore exercise and that often will work against us because it really messes with our adrenals and our stress it pumps out our cortisol and sometimes we can see some weight gain because we're pumping out all that cortisol and we're storing it around the midsection so you know not focusing on nervous system not eating enough protein still eating too many grains maybe drinking too much alcohol doing too much or too little exercise these are definitely common mistakes that women in their 40s tend to make mm. why do you think those are the most common mistakes that they're making well, I think perhaps the exercise one is probably because of our culture, right? And through the years, I think people still are stuck in that mindset that it's all about exercise. Yeah. And whilst exercise is super important and movement is very important, what you put in your mouth is going to have a far bigger impact on your waistline than how much exercise you do normally. So I just think I don't know, maybe it was the 80s, like, um, you know, the, the 80s cardio culture and yeah. people are still stuck in that mindset. Like, I've just got to work out harder and harder and more. Um, so they're just not aware that that's actually the wrong way of looking at things. I think also we have systems in our in, in Australia and in a lot of the Western countries, we have those um, dietary pyramid systems, which have always put grains at the top. Oh, so people yeah. are confused about what to eat and they don't realize that grains can be problematic 
that grains can cause imbalanced blood sugar, that grains can uh, contribute to inflammation. So grains have been revered for so long and they still are. And I think people, you know, they, they still are under that idea that grains can't be so bad and, you know, so um, you know, protein as well. Again, I think that if you don't track protein, well, first of all, who's telling people how much protein to eat? Certainly not doctors and our government and our schooling. So how would they know? Mm -hmm. And then if they don't track it, I'm not a big macro tracker long term, but you've got to track your protein at least for a week or so. So you start to realize how much you're getting and you might be really shocked. But who's doing that, right? And it's just, it's just lack of education. And I think it's a system that is very slow to move. So, you know, and I think it's also, you could probably go down a rabbit hole here, which we won't, about, you know, who's funding what and, and why certain things are being promoted as healthy. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's really a lack of education that is letting women down. Mm, oh, my God. So many things are popping up in my head right now, which is crazy. <laughs> the first one, I want to um, make all our listeners realize that for those who weren't born around the 1980s or 1990s will not know the suffering of you watching your mom watching a video of exercising with a step up <laughs> and her gear and <laughs> burning out these, you know, these, um, these moves just to, you know, lose weight. And I remember growing yeah. up having to think that I could only eat low fat yogurt or no fat yoga because, you know, fat was the devil, fat, you get fat, where we know now and we're teaching many of our women in the world that fat is useful, especially for our hormones. That's right, exactly. You know, I have a good friend who I went to school with and it wasn't long ago that we were in these conversations and I was actually shocked because I'm living in this world and I forget that people not living in the functional medicine world don't don't unaware of the things I'm aware of. And she didn't realize margarine was unhealthy. She still thought that cholesterol was the devil and that we can't be having bacon and eggs. She didn't understand that vegetable oil is extremely pro-inflammatory and contributes to metabolic problems. And she had this vegetable oil that she was cooking with. And I just, I realized, wow, now she's not my typical client. My typical client is quite educated, but she's the typical, you know, 43 year old woman who's just trying to get through life and has kids and, and is still under the impression that these things are, that cholesterol is harmful and that high fats harmful and that vegetable oil and margarine is healthy. It blew my mind and it made me realize we still have so much educating to actually do. A hundred percent, especially around the nutrition side of things. And as you mentioned, also the pyramid, you know, for till today, I'm pretty sure they still have that pyramid and it says the grains are like the most yeah. important thing. And it, taking mm -hmm. it back to what you said previously with the imbalance of your sugar levels, if we're constantly just feeding ourselves grains from morning to lunch to dinner, of course we're going to feel fatigue every time because we're literally bouncing with energy and then dropping down with low energy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I know all about that. I wear this here. This is There's a Band-Aid on it. This is a continuous glucose monitor. So I've been really into this lately. You put this continuous glucose monitor on your arm and you have an app on your phone and you can see, you can see what's going on. And a lot of our clients wear these too. And I've got a lot of colleagues and we share our data. And trust me, those grains, even just a little bit, it just blows my mind how much they spike us and then crash back down. Mm. So there's a lot of people walking around out there with crazy imbalanced blood sugar just up down up down up down and they're wondering why they're tired they're moody yeah. they're irritable they're anxious they can't sleep you know so yeah blood sugar it's huge it's not everything but it is crucial it's like it's a foundation and when you're laying that health house you need a few things in that foundation which if you don't have those things in your foundation nothing else is going to be very steady so you get those foundations right and then you can start to work on the rest. But yeah, blood sugar foundation. 
Mm. And speaking of the Blood Sugar Foundation, do you practice this with your children as well? Because I know from a really young age, I was fed grains and cereals and I had trouble at school concentrating or just being a, a good student because of the diet that I was um, receiving. Listen, I would love to say, yes, my kids eat nothing but animal products and, and produce, but no, of course not. Because my kids are eight and 11. My 11 year old, I don't think she had sugar until she went to one of her first birthday parties. Like she ate really well, you know, for a very long time. But it, it's hard. You've got kids, they go to school. We don't know what happens at school. They're swapping their lunches. People come in with cupcakes and all kinds of things. Then they go to other people's houses. You know, my 11 year old walks around the corner to the IGA here and she buys what she wants. And it's very tricky. And I, and I talk to my clients about this who get, who are learning about all this and they can, it can become very, very stressful as a mother to get hung up mm. on what kids are eating. Now, listen, I get anxiety when I see them eating crap but at the same time I cannot control everything yeah and trying to control things just adds to my stress load and at the end of the day my kids are far more resilient at their age than I am at my age I need to take care of myself so that I'm around long term for them they will grow out of their you know their stage of having such a, a sweet tooth I had a sweet tooth as a kid but the, uh, you know the thing is what I focus on is we educate my husband's very good about this too we educate them we explain sugar to them they know stuff about nutrition and diet that most kids don't know anything about so we explain we educate we try to model um you know every time they sort of go to choose something that's not so healthy we'll we'll talk about it and my hope is that maybe their diet isn't perfect now, but that when they get into their 20s or whenever it might be, maybe symptoms pop up, they'll remember what we taught them. They'll remember mummy's voice. And I say to them, when you start to get zits, because my 11-year-old's coming into that preteen, like when you start, and I have really bad acne, and I've, I've spoken to her all about that, I say, just be aware that it's what you put in your body that matters most. And she knows dairy and sugar, you know? And so I think... Again, I'm not going to kill myself trying to control that because it would kill me and add a huge amount of stress. But we try to educate and primarily in the house, it's pretty damn healthy foods. Mm. You know, it can be a struggle. An eight-year-old's picky and it can be a daily battle with her. So you, I think you've got to pick your battles and just know that if they're well educated and if we set a good example, they will, they will come back to that. They mm. will come back to it. And I admire you saying that and being open about it because too often I, I don't have kids, but I remember myself as an eight-year-old and I was a very picky eater. So, yeah. you know, reflecting back going, cool. Like, and I love how you also mentioned that at that young age, we were more resilient. Our bodies are tuning in through energy like there's no tomorrow compared to us growing older into our late 30s, 40s, 50s, by us putting that stress, trying to control what they're doing, it's just going to detriment our health even more. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. I think we need to let go of control a little bit. We've got to sort of weigh up the detriment of the, the stress versus trying to control, you know, everyone else's diet. You just got to, yeah, you pick your battles and just got to live a little bit too. 100%. And you know what? It's like speaking of control, when speaking to clients who are, you know, in their 40s or re about to reach their 40s, they're wanting to obviously embark this new journey of their life, but they're also trying to control their old selves and they keep comparing to what life was you know, in their 20s or in their 30s. So like, what are some things that have helped you educate your clients around that by going through these, you know, hormonal transitions? Yeah, I think that a couple of things. Number one, it comes back to what we we're talking about before, doing more of the things that support our nervous system and help us getting tuned to ourselves and our own, whatever, if we may have a spiritual practice or not, but just sort of coming back into the moment, being here and present instead of constantly looking back or looking forward. And this is an ongoing struggle for me sometimes, you know, I definitely need to bring myself back into the moment more often, but also the acceptance piece. So we have to get real. 
we have to know that as we enter into our 40s, things will change. Mm-hmm. Most women are going to get symptoms and some more than others. You know, some people say they sailed through perimenopause without a symptom. And eh, maybe that's true. Maybe you're just not aware and in tune with your body <laughs> because most of us are going to see these symptoms because hormones are changing mm-hmm. and they're changing quite dramatically oftentimes. So, you know, we need to be aware and in tune with our body. And that's where being mindful and being present comes into things so that we can shift and ebb and flow and change and get educated and empowered. And that's the big thing too, education and empowering ourselves. Because if we're in our forties and we're having all these change, noticing all these changes, it can be quite scary, quite overwhelming. And we can either live in that place of fear and overwhelm, or we can go, I'm going to choose to educate myself and learn what's going to nourish my body and seek out that information, do the right testing, get the right supplements for my body. Because when you do that and you learn and you get educated, you feel empowered. Mm -hmm. And then that alleviates the anxiety and the fear and helps to support your confidence level. So I think that's really important time to to grow your education um, around your health and learn from people who can, who can support you and also do the right testing so that you feel like you're doing what you can. You can't control everything like cancer and, and all kinds of diseases. They're very multifaceted. It's very, cancer is very complex. Nobody has a guarantee in life, nobody. But you can only do what you can do. And if you do your best, that is good enough and you can alleviate that anxiety, right? Um, so I've kind of gone off track here, I think. Um, oh, I was going to say acceptance. <laughs> acceptance. So, and this is something I have to work on as well. And there are moments I don't accept it. I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh, golly, what happened there? (laughs) How did we get to being almost 44, you know? But acceptance is, I think, one of the biggest keys to happiness, right, and calm in life in all areas, no matter what we're talking about. But if we're talking about perimenopause, putting on weight, having, you know, seeing things sag a little, more wrinkles, if we constantly fight against that and are depressed about what was, then that creates such a state of agitation and unhappiness. Mm. So there is no choice except to accept and look at things like how lucky are are we to be this age, to still be healthy, to be able to to be able bodied, all of this stuff, you know, whatever needs to be done to accept, and then just try to be the best you you can be at every age, not wish for what was or look back at what was. Or that's just going to cause so much turmoil. Mm, and you know what? It's so sad because I know many women who are still going through that Um, and a lot of like elderly women that I come across who are in their, you know, late 50s, 60s who still look back and speak about how life was so good back then because they looked a certain way. So I love the fact that you, yeah, I love the fact that you were, open and honest enough with all of us saying that acceptance comes in stages. It's like practicing anything, you know, it it ebbs and flows. But again, it's just coming back to that mindfulness going, hey, let's accept what's happening right now, but still working on what you're wanting to achieve. Yeah, 100%. Exactly. You can only be the best you today. You can't go back in time, you know, and it's a wasted life completely wasted life to think back and wish and long for because you can't change it. Mm. You are where you are today. So enjoy the moment. 100%. It's wasted energy as well. Like why would you want to continuously remind yourself of what was and not focus on what's now? That's right, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yep. And speaking of, you know, what's now, we also spoke a little bit about um, pre-menopause, but we didn't really speak about the stages of it and I know some of our listeners are in the midst of it or have just you know finished it so I would love for you to explain to our listeners like what are some of the symptoms that you do see with women um, who come into perimenopause yeah so perimenopause can start up to 12 years before you go into menopause so menopause is once you've not had your period for a full 12 months Um, so if you haven't had your period for 12 months, you are now in menopause, but any time before that, even if you haven't had a period for eight months and then you get your period, well, you're not in menopause. 
And that, that perimenopause stage can last up to 12 years. And so it's very different for everybody. One of the most important things or gauge is to ask your mum when she went into menopause, how old was she? Because it is very much genetic based. Mm. So if your mum went into menopause at 50, you'll probably go into menopause around that same age. So that's a good gauge. Um, but you have to be aware that everybody's perimenopausal journey can, can start at a different time you know um i've spoken to women in their late 30s who have every symptom under the sun of per perimenopause and then i've spoken to women who are in their mid to late 40s who barely have many symptoms just a couple of symptoms you know and so it just depends on so many different things so it's, there's no black and white answer to that um how do you know you're in perimenopause? You can do some blood work, but honestly, symptoms are the best way to tell, mm -hmm. you know, symptoms are great gauge. And so what if you're in perimenopause or not, unless we're talking about premature ovarian failure or something like that, you know, you go by these symptoms, maybe you get a set of blood work done that you can look over the course of, you know, a few months because blood is really only a moment in time. And then hopefully you work with a practitioner who's knowledgeable enough to be able to support you in that journey. Um, the only time when it gets a little bit more important to maybe dive more into bloods is when you're thinking about going on some hormone replacement therapy. But often that's more sort of mid to late forties when you start to sort of think about that. Mm. It's so interesting because I'm like thinking back, I'm like, when did my mom go through menopause? Am I going to reach perimenopause shortly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, my mom doesn't really remember. She says she wasn't very good with that. She wasn't very in tune with her body. So I have no idea. She doesn't seem to remember. <laughs> I think she was one of those ones. Oh, I had no, I don't think I had symptoms. I'm like, mm, you had symptoms. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I'm scarred for life. I definitely know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you had symptoms. <laughs> uh, and, you know, speaking of like symptoms and getting into, um, perimenopause we also know that um during those stages we're at risk of certain diseases as well yes yes well it's a very vulnerable time right so what we do in our 40s can really impact us later on in life mm -hmm. we've seen this a lot with dementia and alzheimer's because estrogen plays a huge role in the health of our brain so we want to make sure, and again, coming back to that metabolic health as well, if we let our metabolic health go in our 40s, which is a time when it really can go haywire because our hormones are fluctuating and changing, we're more susceptible to imbalanced blood sugar and getting that weight on around the middle, right, and the high, the high blood sugar. So what we do now really helps to dictate our um our risk of diseases later on in life. So especially osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, and dementia. They're the top three for women that really skyrocket once we go through menopause. And this is in large part due to those declining hormones. So it's not just about replacing those hormones. I do believe in that. I think that's a very vitally important to replace lost hormones, but they're not a silver bullet. You've got to combine it with the nutrient work, the nervous system work, the diet, right? The movement, um, the nervous system, all of that stuff. It's so important. And I love the fact that you're um, telling our audience that it's there's no just one way of going about it because too often you know, there's certain professionals who will just be like, oh, well, you just need to focus on your diet or you just need to focus on your training or medication. It's just like, no, actually, it's like a whole flora of things. Right. It's everything. And that's what functional medicine is. Mm. It's looking at everything, everything and everything all together. And that's just, it's just a healthy way to live. It's a lifestyle, right? It's not just a Band-Aid solution. It's like, well, for the rest of your life, you're going to work on your nervous system. For the rest of your life, you're going to eat a healthy diet diet you know for the rest of your life you're hopefully going to do the right testing and get the right supplements for you right and so on and so forth mm, so so true so true um Tara thank you so much this conversation I know it has blown me away because it's literally put a few like connecting a few dots in like my history going okay I'm gonna have to change a few things in my lifestyle to better my experience once I hit perimenopause but I know a lot of our listeners are going to um, start accepting the situation a little bit better and doing the work yeah yeah no that's awesome well happy to be here it was a fun conversation and yeah hopefully it reaches a lot of women who will become empowered and educated 
I know it will. I know it will. And before we head off, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Where where can they find you? I think the best way to get in touch with me and find me is at, on Instagram, at Tara Thorn Health. And that's probably, I mean, you can go to my website, tarathornnutrition.com, but at Tara Thorn Health is probably the best way. Amazing. Well, girls, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure that you screenshot it, tag us at the Women's Fitness Academy, tag Tara, tag myself. Um, and yeah, let's start taking care of our health as a lifestyle change, not as a quick fix. 100%. I'm here for it.